Now, uh, I think Judy is going to put up, uh, and I want to thank uh, both Judy Bellow and also um, uh, very much thank uh, Joe Lombardo, who set up today's page. Uh, we want to tell you how to order the book. Okay. And uh, this is very easy to do. There's uh, both a QR code, which you can share, and uh, a very easy link, which is iacenter.org. That's center spelled C-E-N-T-E-R. I-A-C-E-N-T-E-R dot O-R-G slash sanctions dash book. So please link to that, order a book, make a donation, help us continue. All of this really will increase our impact in what is an activist campaign against a criminal weapon. Greetings and welcome. Uh, I'm Sarah Flounders and I will be the MC of today's program. I'm the editor of this anthology that we're discussing today sanctions, a wrecking ball in a global economy. Uh, I've been part of the Sanctions Kill campaign from its founding more than three years ago and during an incredible shutdown time of the global pandemic. I'm also part of the International Action Center for the past 30 years and a contributing editor to Workers World newspaper uh, and uh, part of the United National Anti-War Coalition, UNAC, from its founding about 12 years ago. There's um, now more than a thousand people who registered around the world for today's webinar. It's being streamed on several platforms. As I say, it will be posted on YouTube by tomorrow. Everyone who received, who registered will get a link to this YouTube link from Zoom and we're asking you to share it. It's being streamed now on the Sanctions Kill Facebook page. Please share it. Uh, now or later. And uh, as I said, you can order the book. We are an all-volunteer effort. And in addition to the printed copy, we're, we can send you a link when you order the book to the EPUB version. So you can read it on an e-reader, computer, or smartphone. And the digital uh, edition is particularly useful for reaching activists living outside the U.S. because Printing books is pretty expensive and we can forward the EPUB file. We're really interested in providing tools for grassroots political activists who are fighting and mobilizing for change. And the sanctions book is not just an intense analysis of an economic crea crisis created in different countries coping with US sanctions. Uh, sanctions that are designed to totally disrupt their economic and political life. But Sanctions Kill is a campaign. The book has sign-on petitions that gathered thousands of signers, has a PowerPoint toolkit for teaching sanctions in a class. It has concrete activist resources. Now, I want to say I have visited so many different countries over the years of organizing opposition to U.S. wars and they were each country suffering the total dislocation of US sanctions. And the sanctions, you really understand what a brutal weapon, because it's a crisis that hits the most vulnerable. It creates millions of small personal crises. Essential medicines for diabetes, for high blood pressure, for small infections, a broken bone can be a death penalty. Polluted, untreated water, because there's no chlorine, is deadly. And so are multi-story buildings, suddenly without elevators or water pumps. Can't flush the toilet. You have no clean, fresh water. And when the U.S. government seizes the funds in the national treasury, it becomes impossible to pay teachers or medical staff or infrastructure. Industries are shut down. It's a brutal form of war. And it really, it is like an anti-personnel bomb going off in every home. It's meant to divide people in frantic waves. 
and it creates waves of refugees and desperate migrants. In international law, the targeting of civilians is always and totally off limits, even in a shooting war in the midst of a war. And yet, US imperialism has perfected this form of siege warfare that deliberately targets civilians and the most vulnerable civilians, the young, the old, the chronically sick, the poorest. I've seen it firsthand in Iraq, US and UN sanctions, half a million deaths of children under five years of age, no count even of the sick or the aged. I've seen the impact of US sanctions in Lebanon, Sudan, in Syria, with a third of the population displaced refugees, in Gaza's refugee camps, in Venezuela that built free healthcare system. There were small health clinics on almost every street in dense urban areas that were dispensing basic medications, monitoring blood pressure and diet. And suddenly when the US sanctions hit, the shells were bare. There was not a gauze pad or an aspirin. This is what sanctions does. Cuba, who provides more medical staff than the World Health Organization in Africa, has and has done incredible programs in medical research, but they couldn't deliver to their own population the COVID vaccine they had developed without an international campaign to send syringes. They couldn't buy syringes. U.S government imposes sanctions, and they do, through, do so through all different government arms, by first using the media to promote a hysterical campaign that the targeted country is a national security threat. Even Nicaragua was declared a national security threat, if you can imagine. Now, how Cuba or Nicaragua are national security threats to U.S.? Think about it. Little Nicaragua is a threat to U.S. imperialist domination because it's offering its people free health care and free education. Their success exposes what U.S. is not doing and what it could be doing in solving real problems. The sanctions are racist. They overwhelmingly target people of color in the global south, and sanctions come back and hit us here. We had a program this week in the South Bronx, the poorest county in the U.S., and it was at Hostos Community College, a college with the largest number of unhoused students who live in shelters, who have no address. The students had just held a protest because the college hasn't had a cafeteria in three years. Why? There's no money. And the cafeteria just couldn't operate without making a profit. So these students understood so well the impact of sanctions. They wrote messages about what the book meant to them. These are the concrete links we have to make. There's funds for endless war, that's profitable. There's funds for 800 US military bases, for NATO expansion, an additional 60 billion, and then 20 billion more and 30 billion more for US NATO war in Ukraine, but a mere 20 billion for student loan cancellation, that just isn't there. Now, there are enormous changes rumbling below our feet, and the sanctions policy is a real cause of this. The US empire is suddenly finding it's not all powerful. The 800 military bases the expanded NATO military machine? Well, let's look at it. There have been more than 60 US invasions since World War II. The US dollar is a world currency. It's a preferred weapon in using its vast economic power to strangle opposition. Every political decision in the capitalist US economy is driven by profit to enforce its global position. But the ability of the US to enforce global domination is slipping. It's proof of its inability to enforce the devastating sanctions, the thousands of new sanctions on Russia and on China. The global South, the countries of Africa, Latin America, most of the countries of Asia, 
the formerly colonized world are not complying with these thousands of sanctions imposed by the US and the European nations, the NATO members, the sanctions especially imposed on Russia. They need the grain, the energy, the resources, and the ability of the United States to create economic chaos has not succeeded. It is a shock to the powers that be here. Now, this is not the end of US imperialism, but it is a sign of the decay, the erosion of power, the ability of many countries to find ways to connect with each other despite US power. This is a new period. The US sanctions have boomeranged. They've hit hard, especially the European countries. They've cut themselves off at US demand, cut themselves off from cheap gas traded with Russia. And they're devastating the European economies. It's also impacting the US economy right here. But we can see in Britain where they talk about the average person now having to choose between heating and eating. What a choice. The increased sanctions on China have a destructive impact on science and technology on a global scale. But cooperation is expanding among these sanctioned countries. We can look at the BRICS plus new levels of cooperation and trade agreements, the Belt and Road, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Problems are solved by cooperation and not by endless war and sanctions. They're solved by respect for sovereignty and independence and respect for different development paths, for multilateralism versus US hegemony. Now, where do we stand in all this? Working people right here need their own voice. We can't be chained to the corporate media and the capitalist threats. There are new agreements this week with China and the Gulf states and all the Arab countries. There's excited talk of international currency involving the yuan and the ruble and the rupee. And all of this challenges the almighty US dollar. So the world is changing rapidly. And that's what we're discussing today. And that's what the several of the authors who are here with us today are going to be talking in more detail. The impact the sanctions have on particular countries and the ways of resisting. And first up as our opening speaker, we want to call on Erica Young. Erica organizes with the No Do Toll for Korean Community Development. Uh, she organizes and speaks on the continuing U.S. threats on Korea, organizes solidarity with North Korea, and her chapter in the book is Korea, DPRK, Surviving U.S.-U.N. Sanctions and Military Threats. So, Erica, please join us. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah, and a big thank you to the Sanctions Kill campaign on behalf of Noroto for organizing this event. It's a pleasure to be here among all of you to talk about such an important event. Now, earlier this month, the US, South Korea, and Japan imposed coordinated unilateral sanctions against North Korea after the US failed to levy new international sanctions against North Korea, also known by its official name, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or the DPRK, through the UN Security Council. The US has also blacklisted three members of the Workers' Party of Korea for allegedly helping the DPRK's development of weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missiles. Shortly after, South Korea issued its own round of sanctions targeting eight individuals and seven companies for supposedly contributing to the DPRK's weapons programs. Japan also designated three entities and an individual for new sanctions. The US has imposed these sanctions in response to North Korea's missile launches this past year. North Korea is being cast as a pariah state but in reality, the North Korean development of nuclear weapons is a strategy of deterrence against U.S. imperial aggression. The U.S. has occupied and demonized Korea ever since it achieved its independence from imperial Japan. During the Korean War, U.S. forces killed three to five million Koreans. This is a number that essentially amounts to genocide. The U.S. dropped more aerial bombs on North Korea than it did in the entire Pacific theater of World War II, 
And to this day, the Korean War is not over, thanks to U.S. interest in keeping Korea divided. The ceasefire signed in 1953 did not end the war. In fact, the U.S. kept almost a thousand nuclear missiles in South Korea, pointed at the North for almost 50 years. And to this day, the U.S. continues to occupy the South with almost 30,000 soldiers and over 70 military bases under the pretense of a North Korean threat and conducts joint military exercises with neighboring countries. Just this past year in August, the U.S. and South Korea began live military exercises against North Korea after a four-year pause, dramatically escalating tensions on the peninsula. These exercises can involve up to 300,000 soldiers and often rehearse invasions of North Korea, including decapitation exercises to assassinate North Korean leaders. U.S. military exercises also expand beyond Korea to all of Asia. In the same summer, the U.S. gathered 25 countries for the RIMPAC military exercises in a clear show of force against China and North Korea. In the last few months alone, the U.S. and South Korea launched their largest ever air drills through Operation Vigilant Storm, which involved over 240 aircraft and B-1B supersonic stealth bombers near the DMZ. Thus, calls for dialogue and diplomacy are ultimately empty and meaningless when the U.S. ramps up its own military presence in a peninsula it has no business being in. Everything the U.S. has done in Korea has been for its own strategic geopolitical interests, which rely on division and thereby have a vested interest in preventing national liberation and reunification. And while sanctions are just one part of the imperialist playbook, their effects can be devastating. One of the most sanctioned countries in the world, North Korea can't trade with other countries, receive international loans, or import fuel, or much of anything else. From agriculture to industry, sanctions impact all aspects of life in North Korea. Most things North Koreans need, they have to produce for themselves. There is no getting it from somewhere else. Sanctions impact water, sanitation, hygiene, and healthcare infrastructure. According to UNICEF, over 9.75 million people do not have access to safely managed drinking water. Crucially, one of the many types of items that North Korea is banned from importing due to sanctions is water sanitation equipment. Under sanctions, seeds, fertilizers, and agricultural equipment and other types of machinery are banned. And contrary to popular narratives that claim North Korea's government is intentionally withholding food from its population, food insecurity in the country is driven by a lack of access to modern agricultural equipment and techniques and is amplified by natural disasters and the impacts of climate change. In fact, North Korea has a public food distribution system, but it's unable to access the necessary agricultural imports from the world market. Sanctions also hugely affect the quality of health care available in North Korea. North Korea has a national public health care system that provides medical care to everyone free of charge, in general, its health indicators are much higher than in countries with comparably sized economies. However, because of sanctions, North Korea's healthcare system faces shortages of medicine and equipment that impact its ability to treat many preventable diseases. This is the reason why, for instance, up to 37% of deaths among children under five are caused by pneumonia and diarrhea. Under UN sanctions, all metal items are banned. Think about what that means. Metal is everywhere. Sterilizers, ambulances, medical appliances, x-ray machines, operating tables, hospital beds, water filters, metal tubes, pipes, pipe fittings. The list is endless. These kinds of items could be used to prevent and treat common health problems in North Korea. If the basis of sanctions and US aggression against North Korea is really a concern for human rights, one might wonder why these sanctions seem to so obviously trample on North Koreans' right to live. And while the U.S. makes exemptions on a case-by-case -case basis for humanitarian aid, applicants for these exemptions, mainly international and non-governmental organizations, face significant challenges from long wait times for review and approval of exemption requests to unrealistic shipping requirements. 
These administrative barriers to humanitarian aid have had fatal consequences. In just 2018, delays and funding shortfalls resulted in an estimated 3,968 preventable deaths. The U.S. condemns human rights in North Korea, yet in the same breath, it violates those very rights by imposing deadly sanctions. The U.S. claims to want to end the Korean War, yet in the same breath, the U.S. imposes greater sanctions as an act of warfare, knowing full well that North Korea sees lifting sanctions as a precondition to negotiations to ending the war. We must not be fooled by the rhetoric of the United States, but look instead at its actions. And despite these repressive U.S. policies, North Korea has resisted sanctions and managed to hold its own and provide for its people. The North Korean people themselves continue to stay resilient and adapt to the many challenges they face through remarkable advancements in agriculture, energy, and textile and steel production. As the Korean War continues, U.S. sanctions against North Korea serve as a direct act of warfare, prolonging division and preventing reunification against the Korean people's wishes. Since the outbreak of the Korean War in 1950, the U.S. has sanctioned the country's top export industries and any financial transactions involving the country. Collectively, both U.N. sanctions and unilateral U.S. sanctions have resulted in an almost total ban on DPRK-related trade, investment, and financial transactions. The international community must accept the sovereignty of North Korea and provide support rather than isolate, vilify, or strong-arm them. In order to move forward with reunification, we must promote peace and cooperation between the Koreas and reject U.S. imperialism in all forms. As long as they exist, sanctions will continue to serve as a major barrier to renewing peace talks between the two Koreas. We must organize against imperialist sanctions in order to achieve peace, liberation, and reunification in Korea. Thank you, Erica. Oh. That's so well. Uh, our next speaker is Ajamu Baraka, who's a well-known writer, thinker, who coordinates the Black Alliance for Peace. Ajamu is co-director of the U.S. Peace Council and an essential part of the administrative committee of the United National Anti-War Coalition. Ajamu is speaking to us from Colombia and his chapter in the book is Class Warfare and Socialist Resistance in Latin America. Ajamu. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Sarah. Uh, and thank everyone for pulling this very important conversation together today, including the United National Anti-War Coalition, of course, International Action Center. Uh, it's ironic, I guess, that this conversation is happening today, December 10th, which is uh, celebrated around the world, if not in the U.S., as the International Human Rights Day. Um, ironic in the sense that what we are talking about and what we will further uh, explore is the uh, systematic attempt on the part of the U.S. settler colonial state to deny the most elementary uh, human rights to masses of people in this country and around the world. It's important to, to, it's important to note that uh, the U.S. is the uh, leader of the Western Bloc um, and its objective is to maintain the global hegemony of the uh, pan-European white supremacist colonial capitalist patriarchy that emerged uh, in 1492 and represents, and represents the, the hegemonic force that we are all struggling against today. In order to maintain that hegemony, they have decided that they are going to engage in open forms of, of warf warfare. And it's important to note that this sanctioned uh, weapon is in fact uh, a weapon of war. It has uh, devastating consequences for society uh, throughout the, the, the world, um, and it results in death and destruction in a real way. So bringing attention to this is important 
uh, because it's important for us to understand the, the multi-dimensional weapons that are used by Western imperialism to maintain this hegemony. Uh, in order for us to, to develop the strategies we have to develop in order not only to resist, but to defeat this imperialist monster. Sanctions is a part of hybrid war. Um, and one of the most important elements of this hybrid war that helps to uh, continue public support, at least domestically, for the sanctioned regime and for uh, the other various forms of repressive uh, activity that the uh, settler state engages in is the, the, the rationale, the justification for it, the, the ability of the enemy to create uh, an ideological framework uh, that allows for the public to support these methods of, of warfare. It's important also to understand that in this warfare that's being waged against us, this is a warfare being waged not only against nations, but against peoples and, 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 and classes. That, that the, the sanctioned weapon is a weapon in the class struggle. And that is the, what I touched on in my chapter in this book. We're not going to go through all of the elements of that. But it's important to understand that not only are nations impacted, but that the capitalist enemy uses sanctions to intervene domestically into the internal politics, into the class forces, the social relationships in particular states. And we have multiple examples of that. So it's important to understand that this is part of the international uh, class struggle. Um, this sanction regime, again, is about dominance, is about hegemony. And this, this settler colonial regime in the U.S. is, 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 is committed to maintaining that hegemony. Uh, and that's why when we look at Latin America, and we look at how sanctions are used in Latin America, we can understand why they will uh, target Nicaragua, Cuba, or Venezuela small developing nations as uh, threats to U.S. national security. And the reason why they target those states is not because anyone from those states are going to invade the U.S. and overthrow the capitalist state. It is the example that these states represent, that these states are involved in a, a people-centered process to transform their societies, that they are developing their societies on different lines of, of, of values that are contrary to the values that are hegemonic within the U.S. They are committed to the basic human rights that people should be able to experience, like housing, access to medical care, food, clean water, that they are building this process within a process where they are uh, maintaining peaceful relationships among them, them themselves until they are impacted by the interference and interventions of this criminal state. So this is a, a, a component of class war. And therefore we have to, in our response, as I move toward my conclusion, understand that why it's important for us to, un, to, 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 uh, to, to analyze uh, and to be able to explain how sanctions are part of this effort to maintain hegemony. We have to be able to be you to be in a place to respond and to struggle against this process. That this one-sided war being waged against us has to be reversed. So my friends, we say in the Black Alliance of Peace that we uh, cannot just uh, sell wolf tickets, uh, that you're not going to just uh, uh, shout at imperialism and it crumbles. You had to actively organize and struggle against it. This is the war that we are involved in. This is the historical task that we have. It is a task and a responsibility, my friends, that we have to take up and we cannot afford to lose. So thank you, my friends. Thank you for uh, this, this great event. Uh, please go to the blackalliancepeace.com to see the statement that we put out today on uh, International Human Rights Day. Uh, please find ways to support this work and let all of us understand that we are involved in a war, in a war that we have to win. All power to the people. All power to the people. Thank you, Ajami.
Uh, next up is Judy Bello, who is running also the tech for today's webinar and is the design and production coordinator of this book uh, and has contributed hundreds of hours to this project. Judy is on the administrative committee of the United National Anti-War Coalition, is part of the Sanctions Kill campaign, is on the board of the Syria Support Movement, and is the webmaster for countless projects, and has participated in solidarity delegations to Syria and Iran. So Judy, please. You, you need to turn on camera and sound. On. Sound, uh, okay, you can hear me, yes? Yes. Okay. And you can see me? Yep. <laughs> okay. okay, good. All right, you can still see me? Yep. All right, thank you, Sarah. Uh, today, I want to talk about the effects of U.S. sanctions or unilateral coercive measures on the developing nations in the Middle East. The group of countries I'm going to talk about, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and critically, Palestine, can be referred to as the axis of resistance. They are the axis of resistance to the Israeli occupation of Palestine and to Western imperialism. In 1948, Israeli militias occupied Palestine. Many people were killed, more were driven from their homes, and their property was stolen. The remainder have suffered increasingly barbaric oppression over the years, including the destruction of property, arbitrary imprisonment, murders, and massacres. Today, the Gaza Strip is completely walled off from Israel and the people are banned from the sea. Building materials are not allowed and the Israelis say that they are keeping the Palestinians on a diet by only allowing subsistence level of foodstuff to be brought in. Israel has stolen the water from Palestine from the Palestinian aquifer, as well as the water from the Syrian Golan. While Palestinians go without water for drinking and bathing, Israeli settlers have ostentatious swimming pools a few miles away. While the homes of Gazan people are raised through military bombardment, those living in the West Bank and Jerusalem routinely have their houses torn down and their property confiscated by Israeli authorities. In 2006, U.S. sanctions ban companies from doing business with the Palestinian Authority. Public schools and hospitals, along with other government services, were targeted by these sanctions. Meanwhile, individual members of the PA were enriched under the table so they will enforce the Israeli and U.S. policies. Prior to the Second World War, Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine formed a single unit within the Ottoman Empire, Greater Syria, or Al Shams. Within this area, there are deep ties of kinship and economic dependencies. Uh, shifting gears just a little, uh, in 1953, I want to follow my timeline, the United States supported a coup in Iran, which ended an emerging democracy and placed uh, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the son of a previous dictator, on the throne while sweeping aside the modulus or parliament and Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh, who had dared to nationalize their oil wells. After 1978, when the Islamic Republic replaced the Western pu puppet government of the Shah, the first sanctions were placed on Iran. In 1980, the U.S. connived with their Iraqi ally to begin a decade-long war of aggression against Iran. During the war, the United States and their European allies provided weapons to Iraq, including chemicals to make sarin and mustard gas. At the same time, forbidding anyone from trading with Iran. Although Iran won the war in the end and maintained the integrity of its borders, it was left with millions of dead and wounded soldiers and civilians and damaged civilian infrastructure. Their oil refineries, a primary resource, were destroyed. The U.S. increased their sanctions at this point, making it difficult to recover from the war. When I was there in 2007, most of the oil refineries had yet to be repaired. When Iraq Saddam Hussein floated the idea of invading neighboring Kuwait to recoup some of his losses, he wasn't discouraged. 
When he made this move, the U.S. destroyed most of his army in a massive display of force and went on to destroy a great deal of civilian infrastructure in the country. They then instituted severe sanctions on imports of medical supplies, foodstuffs, and equipment to restore the destroyed infrastructure in Iraq. The result was famine and disease across the country. Water sanitation plants and electrical power plants were not able to get the parts for repairs. Hospitals were unable to provide medicines. This situation led to Secretary of State Madeleine Albright's infamous response on being informed that over 500,000 children had died in Iraq due to these U.S. sanctions. Asked if it was worth it, she said that indeed she thought it was. In 1979, Syria, uh, this is around the same time as the uh, Islamic Republic uh, began. In 1979, Syria, which was a lot, has a large Palestinian population, was sanctioned by the U.S. as a state sponsor of terrorism. Syria was also the only country that supported Iran in the Iran-Iraq war. The initial sanctions on Syria were bearable as it was rich in resources and Hafez Assad provided a great deal of social support to the people while enforcing a policy of secularism, providing for equal opportunities in business and government and personal security for a highly diverse population. New sanctions placed on Syria in 2004 due to the Iran-Iraq war caused uh, uh, the beginnings of a buildup of unrest among the poor. In early 2011, color revolution style Arab Spring protests arose across Syria, which formed the basis for a US fueled proxy war fought by terrorists from across the Middle East and around the globe. The war spilled over into Iraq where Mosul was raised by US bombers targeting ISIS prior to their move to Syria in 2014. And it spilled over into Lebanon where terrorist groups wreaked havoc, particularly in conservative Sunni cities in the North. Eventually Hezbollah came to Syria's assistance out of self-defense. Today, following a fierce 10 year proxy war, Syria has one third of its territory occupied by the US and its allies. Turkish-backed terrorists continue to control Syria's Idlib province, while Israel has annexed the Golan and routinely bombs Syrian territory from there. A proxy force led by the US allied Kurds administers an area in the northeast of the country, which includes most of Syria's oil wells, their wheat producing region, and a significant water source, the Euphrates. The area is protected by approximately a thousand U.S. soldiers. With the country devastated by bombing raids and terrorist attacks, the U.S. placed new sanctions on Syria. These sanctions, ironically defined by the U.S. Caesar Civilian Protection Act, include what are called secondary sanctions, which punish any country or business that provides any support to the primary sanctioned country. Meanwhile, the Caesar sanctions are specifically tailored to prohibit reconstruction in Syria. They have not only destroyed the Syrian economy, but in conjunction with the theft of Syrian oil and wheat resources, they have devastated the population. Due to the secondary sanctions, international companies are afraid to provide any resources due to the fear of U.S. retaliation. Since Syrian banking and much of their import export business was either directly with Lebanon or processed through Lebanese banks, the secondary sanctions on Syria brought down the already fragile and corrupt economy of Lebanon as well. And with the collapse of the banks in Lebanon, the equally unstable and corrupt government has collapsed as well. Elena Duhan, the United Nations Rapporteur on Secondary Sanctions, recently visited Syria. On her re return, she demanded that the sanctions on Syria be lifted immediately. The Syrian pound has been devalued by a thousand percent so that their money has no value outside the country. There is a wave of cholera across the country due to the failure of sanitation and water purification facilities. 
Electricity is reduced to two or four hours a day for most people. They are cold and hungry. Refugees remain homeless. Manufacturing is shut down. Hospitals cannot get the 24 hour electrical supply necessary to run ventilators and other life support equipment. They don't have anesthetics to do surgeries. Terms like universal free medical care and education have little meaning in this context. Syria with its money devalued to near zero must now buy the heating oil and wheat it used to produce on its own. According to Elena Duhan, even the United Nations has trouble providing aid to Syria. When I was in Syria at the height of the war, there was food to eat and also the population of, to feed the population of displaced people. There was electricity in Damascus anyway, full time. Terrorists attacked water and energy supplies, which were soon repaired. Meanwhile, the Syrian government continued to supply power and other resources, even to terrorist occupied regions, because these resources are necessary to support the civilian population. Sanctions, more rightfully called unilateral coercive measures, are a form of siege warfare. They are not a kinder, gentler form of inducement, but rather a brutal war on the civilian population of a country. The U.S. uses these methods without mercy. The term hybrid warfare seems clever and new, but aggressive imperialist countries have been waging wars of this sort on smaller ones for millennia. It is barbaric and despicable. Thank you, Judy. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's harrowing. Next, I would like to introduce Anne Garrison, whose essay, Sanction, Sanctioning the Horn of Africa, co-written with John Philpott, appears in this book. She is a contributing editor to Black Agenda Report, also a contributor to The Gray Zone and other publications, and a Pacifica radio reporter and host. Earlier this year, Anne Garrison spent two and a half months in Ethiopia and Eritrea to report on the Ethiopian civil war that began in November, 2020. So, Anne, please join us. Thank you, Sarah. And let me say, I'm probably a little over time, but uh, if you watch me and tell me um, uh, that, that I need to be shorter, I have two paragraphs that I can hack, okay? So let me go ahead and try. Okay, my essay in Sanctions, Wrecking Ball in a Global Economy, is Sanctioning the Horn of Africa, which I wrote with international criminal defense attorney, John Philpott. It's specifically about sanctions on Ethiopia and its neighbor, Eritrea. The context is the devastating two-year civil war, which is also a U.S. proxy war in Ethiopia. It's widely agreed that casualties have been in the hundreds of thousands, far higher than in Ukraine. And the International Displacement Monitoring Center says that in 2021, Ethiopia had the world's largest number of IDPs, internally displaced persons who'd been displaced by conflict. Now the situation on the ground there has changed since the book went to print, but nothing we wrote about the sanctions has changed. The first remain in place and more are still pending. A peace agreement, this is what changed, a peace agreement was signed in Pretoria on November 4th and a peace implementation agreement was signed in Nairobi on November 12th. But it's not clear that the peace is going to hold. And it's even less clear that the US is going to accept it despite how much Ethiopians have suffered. President Biden has not lifted the sanctions he imposed on Ethiopia and Eritrea in 2021 and 2022. Instead, he's threatened more sanctions and more are pending in two particularly nasty sanctions bills in Congress, House Resolution 6600, the Ethiopian Stabilization, Peace and Democracy Act, and Senate Bill 3199. Uh, the Ethiopia Peace and Stabilization Act of 2022. Both are, of course, the opposite of what they claim to be. And now I'd like to skip to a screen share 
of a map of the Horn of Africa uh, to situate what we're talking about. As I know, a lot of people don't know a lot about Ethiopia, or Ethiopia, Eritrea, or the Horn. So let's see. Yeah. Okay, this is the Horn of Africa within a map of Africa. Uh, this is Eritrea, this is Ethiopia, this is Somalia. Uh, and we can't see your screen share. Oh. Okay, you can't. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I didn't share it. That's what <laughs> I did not share it. Okay, let me see. Okay, let's see if I can. Let's see how I hope this is going to work. Okay, if it doesn't, I'll make do. Okay, I, no, no screen share. Um, uh, uh, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Somalia are the three largest countries in the Horn. Uh, a tiny country that borders all three is Djibouti, as a nation of just over a million people that hosts Chinese, French, Italian, Japanese, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabian, and U.S. military bases. Uh, there are also all sorts of foreign military deployments out in the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean. And all this foreign military presence testifies to how geostrategic the Horn and adjacent waterways are. 10% uh, of the world's trade, including 10% of its oil, passes through the Suez Canal and the Bab el Mandeb Strait at either end of the Red Sea. Between 20 and 40 percent of the world's oil passes through the Straits of Hormuz. Uh, Somalia may have the largest untapped coastal oil reserves in the world. Eritrea sits on the untapped mineral reserves in the Arabian Nubian Shield. Ethiopia has a lot of fertile, fertile cropland and more, including the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which will generate enough power to deliver electricity to all of Ethiopia and beyond if the electricity delivery can, in infrastructure can be built. And I say if because the war has drained Ethiopia's resources and radically slowed its development. I traveled through an area where a Chinese firm had been paving the roads, but they packed up and left when the war started. There was no running water, no electricity. But the U.S. sanctions and other forms of aggression in the Horn aren't just about resources. They are, as Ajamu said, about global hegemony, as they are everywhere. In 2018, after Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed came to power, he negotiated peace with Ethiopia's neighbor Eritrea, ending a long-standing war, and then negotiated, negotiated a regional agreement for cultural trade and security co cooperation between Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Somalia. That was more peace, independence, and potential than the U.S. was willing to tolerate. Hence, this war began in, this proxy war began in November 2020. I went to Ethiopia primarily to report on the consequences of the war in which the U.S. was represented by its longtime client, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, or TPLF which ruled Ethiopia for 27 years from 1991 to 2018 when it was overthrown by popular uprisings. While in power, the TPLF divided the country into ethnically identified states and forced citizens to carry identity cards specifying their ethnicity, even if they were of mixed heritage. The TPLF fired rocket, wait a minute, I'm sorry. This created a storm of ethnic politics that was at the center of the war and that Ethiopians are going to have to overcome. Um, the TPLF fired rockets into Eritrea at the same time that it attacked the Ethiopian army, drawing Eritrea into the war. The US foreign policy establishment hates Eritrea because it has an egalitarian political system. It's one of two African nations refusing to collaborate with AFRICOM. It's avoided World Bank and IMF debt strangulation, and it demands a fair price for its natural resources. As soon as the war began, uh, the hashtag Tigray genocide, hashtag Tigray genocide appeared within 24 hours of the TPLF's first attack on the Ethiopian army in November 2020. Ensuing atrocity reports, in the servile Western press and those of Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International portrayed the Tigaru, the people of Tigray, as victims. 
various Congress people, including Ilhan Omar, began urging State Department to conclude that there's a Tigray genocide underway. And I think we all know claims of genocide have superseded the war on terror as an excuse for U.S. aggression. The bills to further sanction Ethiopia and Eritrea are extensive and extremely harsh. Highlights include a demand that Ethiopia completely capitulate to the U.S. military. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry, that belongs someplace else. <laughs> sorry, I wasn't, I didn't have this. I got flustered about that. Okay. Um, and now I've spent more than half my time explaining the context of the sanctions and B2. I can cut some of that. Now I'm going to try to shorthand the specifics of the sanctions, which are detailed in the book. On September 2020, in September 2021, President Biden issued Executive Order 14046, invoking. You're, now I'm out of time. Well, yeah, just about. So just to, to wrap okay. it. Okay, okay. Um, I'm I'm actually going to go back and and cut a couple of paragraphs because I need to talk about this. Okay, invoking the National Emergencies Act and other sections of U.S. Code, and claiming that Ethiopia, uh, way out on the eastern edge of Africa, threatens U.S. national security. All right. Do you want me to just stop so other people can practice? I can go back and cut the two paragraphs that were that are making this too long while somebody else goes on. No, like, just what, just oh, finish up. Go ahead. Okay. In November 2021, uh, Biden imposed sanctions on Eritrea, which include exclusion from the SWIFT system, which enables banks to rapidly execute international financial transactions. Eritrea is now one of four countries excluded from using the SWIFT system. The other three are Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Those sanctions remain in place, and the consequence of being unable to use the SWIFT, SWIFT system are cumulative. States, corporations, and commercial shipping and other transit companies become afraid to deal with a sanctioned country for fear of falling afoul of U.S. sanctions. In January 2022, Biden imposed trade sanctions by canceling Ethiopia's preferential trade status under the African Growth and Opportunity Act. This caused a lot of poor Ethiopians their jobs and limited Ethiopia's ability to accumulate the foreign cash reserves that it needs for international trade. Biden could impose more sanctions whenever he wants, and the sanctions still pending in Congress are extremely harsh, some of them unprecedented. Highlights include IMF and World Bank strangulation and a demand that the sanctions will not be lifted unless Ethiopia completely capitulates to the U.S. militarily, that it, quote, cease all offensive military operations associated with the civil war and other conflicts in Ethiopia. In other words, surrender, totally surrender. And unless it allows, quote, independent investigators into the country to investigate war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Both include sweeping restrictions on speech, particularly on social media. H.R. 6600 makes way for the State Department to cooperate with the social media giants to stop misinformation, disinformation, and hate speech. Uh, Senate Bill 3199 threatens to censure and sanction anyone spreading misinformation, disinformation, and hate speech inside and outside Ethiopia and Eritrea, including the diasporas. Okay, we need to organize a network to uh, stop the passage of these sanctions and lift those already in place. Now, I can, I can go back and... And, thank you. and, and let's go on to... Go uh, thank you so much. Okay. And you'll need to turn off your camera and sound. Oh, okay. After? No. Okay. You, I need to turn off my camera and sound? I, I thought you finished. We have to go on to the next oh, speaker. Okay, so after, so I turn everything off after you I'm You don't done. need to turn off your camera, just the sound, so that people oh, can Oh, okay, them. okay, I need to mute. Okay, That's awesome. okay. thank you. Okay, um, before we go on to our next speaker, I'm just going to make a couple of announcements and ask Judy's help on this. Um, one of One of them is about the uh, United National Anti-War Coalition call for 
actions in January, nationally coordinated actions. Uh, as many of you know, across the U.S. and Canada, there was a call for actions in October that resulted in, in 70 some coordinated actions against U.S. wars. And it was really a huge step forward in the political movement in the, in the U.S. and in Canada to uh, coordinate actions large and small at that time. Uh, a few weeks ago, with many other organizations, we put out a call for local actions to stop U.S. wars against U.S. sanctions uh, in mid-January, the Martin Luther King Day week from January 13th to January 23rd. Uh, and we think that this could again be a time of many grassroots groups responding, connecting with each other. Uh, and it would be a very important step. We're, we're also, of course, supporting the demonstration in New York City at Times Square on January 14th. But what else is possible nationally? We need more than one action. We need groups talking to each other, bringing in every struggle. Palestine, Yemen, uh, the blockade of Cuba, the endless wars and the dire, dire threat of the war, NATO expansion uh, in Ukraine. So unless we're addressing all these wars and looking at the link, we can be defenseless in this period. You can contact unacpeace.org, that's U-N-A-C, peace, P-E-A-C-E, dot O-R-G, to list your event, to endorse the call to action. <coughs> now, the other announcement is that, uh, which we've been making earlier in the day too, is how to order the book. Uh, let's put up that screen for just a minute, Judy, uh, on how to order the book. Well, maybe it won't happen and I'll come back to it later. Okay, um, let's just go on to our next speaker and we'll come back to that announcement. Uh, Carlos Martinez is our next speaker and uh, we want to welcome Carlos who's uh, speaking to us from London. Carlos is a writer and a campaigner, the co-editor of the Friends of Socialist China. He's a co-founder of the No Cold War and a member of the International Manifesto Group's coordinating committee. Carlos Martinez's chapter is Sanctions in a New Cold War on China, but we asked Carlos today to discuss the U.S.-NATO war on Russia, a topic where that he's also spoken and written on extensively. So, Carlos, I think you're up next. So thank you. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, for that very kind introduction. And thank you to all the other panelists um, who've been extremely interesting and insightful. And thank you, of course, to everyone who's taken the time out of their day to attend this event, very important event. So since February this year, the imperialist powers of the US, Canada, the European Union and Britain have imposed massive, unprecedented unilateral and illegal sanctions against Russia. These sanctions are very wide ranging. Russia has been cut out of SWIFT, which is the global messaging network for international payments, in order to try and cripple the Russian economy. Russian banks have had their assets frozen, over a trillion dollars worth of assets. Biden ordered a ban on Russian energy imports to the US. Easy enough for him to do, given that the US was importing precious little Russian energy in the first place. But the story in Europe is much more complicated. Germany, for example, has been reliant on Russian energy for more than 50 years. Now, however, however, it's been cajoled into suspending the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. The European Union claims it's working towards ending its energy reliance on Russia. The G7 countries have just agreed on a price cap of $60 per barrel for Russian oil, which is more or less equal to the cost of production. This is another flagrant violation of international law 
and all the rules and norms governing global trade. And just as a side note, it's kind of interesting to observe here that no countries whatsoever were sanctioned as a result of the West's genocidal wars on Iraq or Afghanistan or Libya or Yugoslavia. You know, there's this liberal narrative going around that, well, Russia's invaded another country and you know, you, we've got to do something, therefore sanctions are justified. Even if you accept that argument, and obviously you shouldn't, you should at least ask why these rules don't apply when it's the US and its allies that are doing the invading. So continuing, this economic war on Russia is having a hugely negative effect on Europe, which is experiencing an increasingly severe cost of living crisis. Energy prices have gone through the roof. Food prices have gone through the roof. Britain's inflation is running at over 11%. So wages are declining rapidly in real terms. Meanwhile, um, you know, we're going into a cold winter in which literally millions of people are going to have to make that terrible choice that Sarah referenced earlier between eating and heating. The Guardian journalist Simon Jenkins, not a progressive by any reasonable definition, wrote recently that sanctions against Russia are, quote, the most ill-conceived and counterproductive policy in recent international history. World energy prices are rocketing, inflation is soaring, supply chains are chaotic, and millions are being starved of gas, grain, and fertilizer. By the way, another side effect of these sanctions and coercive measures is that Europeans have basically stopped even talking about climate change. Europe reducing its dependence on Russian natural gas doesn't mean shifting to low emissions energy sources. It means buying huge quantities of fracked shale gas from the United States. There is nothing green about that. Meanwhile, Germany's coal usage is up 17% on last year. It's reopening coal mines, as is France. Britain's just announced that it's going to build a new coal mine. You've got the sixth richest country in the world, the first country to kind of to colonize the atmosphere with its own industrial revolution is now ramping up production of the most polluting fossil fuel. So this whole project is essentially directed towards propping up the short term interests of US imperialism alone to the detriment of all humanity. And that's parallel to the entire new Cold War project, which is led by the US and which is directed against Russia, against China, against Iran, against Cuba, against Venezuela, against the whole global south. You know, the corner of Biden's foreign policy has been to essentially recreate the Cold War alliance, you know, when the freedom-loving West united under US leadership against the evil commies of the East. When we talk about the new Cold War, to be honest, to a quite significant degree, we're really talking about a century-old war to preserve, to consolidate, to expand the imperialist world system. The war of intervention in Russia from 1918, when the US, Britain, France and others joined forces with the proto-fascist white Russians to try and overturn the Russian Revolution. The never-ending attempts to undermine the socialist world and to impose neo-colonial domination in Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, the Caribbean, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Contra War in Nicaragua, regime change operations and military dictatorships in Brazil, in Indonesia, in Chile and elsewhere, the West's support for apartheid regimes throughout Southern Africa. And now Biden is looking to get the band back together to revive that same project, a hybrid war against socialism, against sovereignty and against multipolarity. It's a manifestation of the project for a new American century. Now that was a neocon project, uh, a neocon concept, a Rumsfeld, Cheney, Wolfowitz concept, but it's been taken up by successive Democratic and Republican administrations. As far as foreign policy is concerned, there's only one party, the War Party. As Tanzania's first president, Julius Nyerere, famously said, the United States is also a one-party state, but with typical American extravagance, they have two of them. <clears throat> what does this new Cold War look like right now in December 2022? It involves this NATO proxy war in Russia, which the US wants to draw out as long as possible in order to weaken Russia. It involves the unprecedented sanctions that we've been talking about. It involves NATO expansion. It involves AFRICOM expansion. It involves the deepening of the criminal blockade against Cuba. It involves 
so-called decoupling and trade war against China, along with the creation of AUKUS, a continuing campaign of China encirclement, the permanent threat of nuclear annihilation against North Korea. And all this to preserve a favorable business environment for American capital, so that a degenerate and moribund social class can enjoy cheap and easy access to land, resources, labor, and markets. But there's good news. The good news is that the world has changed and we can already see cracks emerging in this Cold War alliance. Even though the West has imposed these massive sanctions on Russia, actually they're hurting Europe far more than they're hurting Russia. Russia can find other buyers for its energy. Virtually no developing country has joined in with the sanctions, not India, not Pakistan, nor most of the countries of Africa and Latin America, certainly not China. China-Russia relations are better than they've been since the mid-1950s. Um, stoking conflict between China and Russia has been an invariant of US foreign policy on an explicit and well-understood basis of divide and rule. Brzezinski talks about this in his, his Grand Chessboard book, um, very important book, and I recommend people to read it if they haven't already. He warns that the most dangerous scenario would be a grand coalition of China, Russia, and perhaps Iran, an anti-hegemonic coalition. Well, sorry, that's exactly what's happening. Meanwhile, very few countries in the world can take the idea of decoupling from China seriously. China is the number one trading partner of more than two thirds of the world's countries. Around 140 countries are participating in the Belt and Road Initiative. Even Europe can't take part in decoupling from China and Russia without engaging in what is essentially economic suicide, which is why Germany is already starting to roll back on its commitment to sanctions and why Olaf Scholz was the first Western head of state to visit Beijing since 2020. The inescapable reality is that imperialism is in decline. The internal contradictions of this new Cold War alliance mean that it can't go on much longer. Meanwhile, the socialist world, led by China, is on an upwards trajectory once again. The rise of a multipolar world order is ultimately unstoppable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlos. Very well put. Rick Sterling helps pull to lots of things together. Uh, Rick is an independent journalist, a steering committee member of the Syria Support Movement, a board president at Mount Diablo Peace and Justice Center, and also the Task Force on the Americas. We're planning a big event, as I understand, in the Bay Area this week. Mm -hmm. uh, Rick's chapter is U.S. Sanctions, War by Other Means, and it's a summary of the 40-page report that Rick, John Phil. Pot and David Paul uh, collectively wrote. It's distributed by the Sanctions Kill uh, campaign, and it was distributed, um, the first version of it, to every member of Congress, to every country in the United Nations, and uh, along with being distributed widely to lots of activists. It's available in a link at the sanctionskill.org uh, website. So, Rick, take it. Yeah. Way. And in the meantime, I will send Carlos this uh, video and, and that will roll us out at the end. Sarah, yeah, okay. I can send him the link. Thank you. Chat. Okay. okay. Yeah. Th uh, thanks, Sarah. Uh, we're running a little bit uh, behind here, so I'll be, be brief. Um, uh, the first thing I want to mention is to encourage everybody to participate in the actions that are coming up uh, organized by United National Anti War Coalition in in mid-January, uh, January 16, or, uh, 13 through 22. That's going to include two weekends. And um, I think there's a tremendous amount to do. I can think of uh, education work, uh, protests, and also con you know, letting your member of Congress know how you feel about sanctions. Uh, one thing that we discovered in, in preparing the report is that, um, uh, yeah, yeah, you can remove that, Judy, please. Uh, one thing we discovered in preparing the report is that um, uh, while we're a minority in, within the United States and within North America and actually the West, uh, it turns out that the vast majority of nations in the world and the vast majority of the population of the world is dead set against sanctions. They know exactly what they are. 
They know what unilateral, unilateral co coercive measures are, and they're opposed to them. In fact, at the United Nations General Assembly, 70% uh, of the nations uh, voted uh, on a resolution in December of 2020 that stated unilateral coercive measures and legislation are contrary to international law, international humanitarian law, the charter of the UN, and the norms and principles governing peaceful relations among states. That's a very strong statement. The full uh, resolution, there's a link to it in, in our report that, uh, that we recommend people look at, but uh, it just is typical that if, uh, you know, we, we talk to our, our uh, neighbors, we talk to our friends and family, and a lot of people don't know, they scratch their head about sanctions, they scratch their head about unilateral course of measures, and, uh, and yet in most of the world, uh, they know exactly what they are and they're uh, dead set against them. Now, uh, th this of course is changing now within the last uh, nine or 10 months because of the sanctions on Russia, which are impacting, heavily impacting the population in Europe and also impacting the population in North America as Carlos was, was detailing. Uh, but uh, in general, we've got a lot of education work to do around unilateral course of measures, or otherwise known as sanctions. We, now, why is it that the people are, that, that our friends and neighbors don't know about sanctions? Well, this is a, a really good example of, of censorship. Uh, there's no other word for it. I did a, a, a look into the archives of the New York Times and was amazed to find they have never once made a reference to unilateral coercive measures. It's like it's been obliterated. So uh, the, the thing about the Global South, they not only have not signed on to the, the uh, onerous sanctions against Russia, they're dead set against sanctions in principle because so many countries around the world have experienced it and have been, um, you know, have been, uh, uh, the population in, in countries have been devastated. Uh, it, there's been a, a study showing that at least 100,000 people a, in Venezuela have died as a, as a result of the sanctions on Venezuela. Where's the accountability? So uh, it, with John Philpott's leadership, John's an attorney in Montreal, an international human rights attorney. He, uh, uh, with his leadership in the, uh, we, in the team pr preparing the report, we uh, include the, the possibility that in future there should be some accountability for the consequences of sanctions. So uh, I think I'm not gonna uh, say much more now. Uh, we're running a little bit late and it'll be interesting to see the video that's being prepared. But I just wanna recommend to people to uh, download the report. It's available right now. If you simply go to the sanctionskill.org website, you can download the 40 page report. Uh, and you and there's also a link there to get the book. Uh, I highly recommend people do that to, to help our own understanding and to teach more people about the consequences of sanctions and um, and how to resist and and change them. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you very much. Wow, that was short and tight. Thank you so much, uh, Rick. And I'm going to hope now that um, Carlos can bring up uh, Lee Su Hin's video. And I'm going to thank everyone for their enormous uh, patience to our wrinkles on this. It does make it interesting. Um, but thank you, Rick. And Carlos, if you could um, bring up this video that um, Lee Su Hin is making. And, and Lee Su Hin is making it in English and in Chinese. And he is... Uh, has already introduced it into several film festivals in China. And that is why he's anxious to show us a little segment. I, I think it's eight minutes of uh, what is a 33 minute video, short video. So are we ready to roll with it, Carlos? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna try. The, the share sound option is disabled and I don't know why, but oh. let's... Uh... Uh, just just uh, let me know if it's working or not. Countries has nothing. That's crazy. Yes, it's working. Let's expose the failures of the United States domestically. 
with our inability to make sure that but louder and get the health care they need. It has also exposed the destructive role of the United States in the world as failure to cooperate louder, please. as protection of the profits of transnational corporations over the health of the people. But there is a more vicious role played by the United States in particular and the Western countries in general. They have been using sanctions as weapons against the world. We can also see that sanctions was used where the vaccines were weaponized. What countries could receive the small supply of vaccines that were being distributed was based totally on who was complicit with the United States. Countries that were sanctioned in every way were prevented from receiving vaccines or the basic essential supplies. So Cuba could develop a vaccine, but the syringes in order to deliver it to their own population were in limited supply and it was very difficult to get access. The United States was playing a destructive role during that time when the Secretary General of the United Nations was calling for an end to the U.S.'s illegal sanctions. The U.S. escalated those sanctions, continued to put new sanctions on, on countries. And so as a result of that, countries really struggled to be able to get the items that they needed in order to take care of their population. Yeah. 古巴、委内瑞拉和阿富汗等国，美国对他们实施严厉的制裁，他们都没有收到任何美国的疫苗，美国甚至冻结他们去购买急需要治疗新冠的药物的外汇。In the days since the pandemic has ebbed back in national attention, we have very consciously moved forward with a campaign against U.S. use of sanctions. But even this has now changed globally. The war in the Ukraine, the brutal NATO expansion into the Ukraine, the arming and weaponizing of the people in Ukraine, the firing on the Russian population in Ukraine, all of this created a crisis that could not be avoided. According to sanction kills, an international campaign organized by many peace and justice organizations and activists, including Sarah Flanders, Margaret Flowers, and Lee Tzu Hing, who criticized Western countries using sanctions as weapons against the world. Sanctions are essentially the imposition of arbitrary measures creating inhumane and economic hardship on a targeted country. Sanctions from the United States affected a third of the world's population, imposing more than 8,000 measures in more than 40 countries. Economic sanctions are also known as embargoes. The U.S. effort to impose and to get all of the European Union and Britain to go along with the sanctions was to cut the trade relations with Russia. A very different thing happened, though, and that is the rest of the world refused to go along with U.S. sanctions because they were still able to trade with China and have economic relations and exchange. And so sanctions on Russia, and now new, even extensive sanctions on China, are not succeeding. The people of the world increasingly are deciding to do what is in their own interests. They have a population to feed, and they need food, fertilizer, technology, and they can't get that from the West except by onerous conditions that are an assault on their sovereignty. So we have produced a, a new book, which is an anthology looking at the both difference that exists now and also looking at sanctions as a weapon that is used again and again against, there's a whole study of the impact of U.S. and U.N. sanctions on the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, on uh, Iran, on still today the continuing sanctions on Syria, and so on. But the more than 40 countries is a real theme that we take. The number of countries that are impacted it, uh, affects the whole economy regionally. So we're trying to explain this to working people here, that these sanctions come back, they boomerang onto the economy here with increasing inflation, uh, recession that really people are coping with in the layoffs 
and in a, an intensely fragile economy. Sanctions, a wrecking ball in a global economy, is a book with several dozen writers, including Sarah Frondos, Margaret Flowers, and me, comprehensive analysis against Western sanctions against other countries. The impact of sanctions on more than 40 developing and formerly colonized countries, countries one third of the world population, was barely discussed in mainstream media for decades. I think the necessity for the workers' movement in the U.S. to explain to working people that racism, that bigotry, that attacks on another country are not in their own interests. And this really helps to combat also the anti-China sentiment that is being consciously whipped up every single day by the media. It's used to justify the new rounds of sanctions on China, whether it's in chips or uh, whether it is in cotton from Xinjiang. Every form of U.S. policy is to intensify and to justify sanctions. And we feel that this has to be combated within the United States. This has to be explained again and again. The books are one way, the webinars are another, the demonstrations and rallies are still another. But it's important for working people to have their own voice in this and not only the voice of corporate power. Now globally, the United States is trying desperately to hold on to its its domination of the world. And that's not, it's failing. It's not going to succeed because the world has seen and knows that the United States is not a reliable partner, is not an honest partner, will always put the profits of the corporations over the lives of its own people and people anywhere in the world. And the United States is harming itself by not cooperating with China and learning from the actions that China has taken over the past 70 years. Uh, the United States needs to let go of this hubris, of this American exceptionalism, and recognize that we have a lot to learn from people all around the world, and that it's necessary for our future that we become a nation of cooperation, of solidarity, of one that values human life and protection of the planet. The United States' future depends upon this change. In contrast to the sanctions and vaccine imperialism of the United States against the world, China has launched successful vaccine diplomacy to support the world. Also, China supports global economic developments by encouraging more international economic cooperation. Last November, China organized the fifth China International Import Expo to encourage more global imports, especially imports from the global south. 在进博会,中国非常慷慨,派他们的大门邀请全世界,甚至包括许多目前对中国实施无数制裁的国家的公司,也被容许来销售他们的产品。Let me read a chapter I wrote from the Capitalism on a Ventilator. It's no secret that domestically, police brutality and the war on terror is in fact just more oppression for black and immigrant communities. That won't be help justice in the U.S. unless there's a people's revolution for fundamental social change that demand the moving of money and wealth from the richest 1% and the war back to the working class, people of color, immigrants and indigenous people. Wow. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Lee Soo Hin, for really pushing us to show this video. I think it did uh, capture many of the points that speakers made today who worked on other chapters. Uh, thank you, Carlos, for helping <laughs> us push it forward uh, on the technical aspects, and to Judy for um, every step of the way in the work that she's done. Uh, on the book on today's webinar. Uh, 
I say to everyone who's listening to the program today, uh, thanks for sitting through the rocky parts of this. Uh, we will post it on YouTube um, with a light edit of uh, as we fumbled through a few things, take it out. Uh, it, you also can take it uh, bumps and all from the stream at uh, Facebook at sanctionskill.org uh, or sanctionskill Facebook site. Uh, and let's stay in touch. I, I do want to encourage everyone who uh, is watching today, you will get a Zoom link by tomorrow this time, 24 hours later, that has a link to the YouTube. Please share that. Uh, and please uh, check out the book because it is a way of really spreading this. Uh, check out the report that uh, Rick uh, Sterling explained. Uh, that's downloadable on our site. Uh, the book, we're asking uh, donations and we have bulk copies that we can uh, send out of, of 10 copies at a 50% discount. So that really makes it a possibility for groups to use, for classes to use. Uh, that makes a huge difference. Uh, and really every one of these things are a collective tool. So thank you to everyone who's here today. I think we're going to call this a wrap uh, and uh, continue to connect together. Let's also connect for the days of coordinated action in January because it's both the books and the petitions and the analysis, but it's putting it into the streets that we want to do. So if you're capable of doing anything from a banner drop to a meeting, to a teach-in, to a demonstration, please be in touch. Thanks.